him sweetgrass I've given him sage and today I plan to give him some cedar to make sure that the words that are spoken today go up to where they need to be heard I uh, first I first learned about the senator in 2015 like many of us who were also devoted to doing the right thing I quickly joined him in his presidential race um, as a delegate from South Dakota. I uh, traveled to the DNC and got as involved as I possibly could and eventually it led me to the occupation of my father's homeland in uh, Standing Rock, North Dakota. Doing the right thing became the basis for this national network of organizers and people who were like-minded and they were actually the first people to show up after the DNC to Standing Rock to help support our cause against the Dakota Access Pipeline. It was this network of doing the right thing that really embraced a lot of us. You know, Bernie Sanders was able to bring our causes to the forefront, and never in history have we had a presidential candidate supportive like Bernie has. And so I really wanna take the time to thank the senator, his organizations, um, our revolution. Deb Parker has been an amazing influence on my life, as well as Nicole Willis, who is uh, with the Natives for Bernie team. Sorry, I'm trying not to get emotional. Um, the People's for Bernie team also on the internet has been a huge influence in spreading our messages and supporting our cause. So I really want to thank um, a lot of my mashke that are watching now. Um, I also want to thank everybody else who showed up and supported us during our fight and continue to support us in our fight here against what's going on in the world. Um, I'm really proud of the consistency that the senator continues to show and so I really want you guys to just take everything in right now and um Inajipo Zakiopi welcome Senator Bernie Sanders Thank you all very much uh, for allowing me to be with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, and it truly is an honor uh, to be with you. Uh, and I will tell you why. The American people, especially the young people, understand very profoundly what the Native American people have gone through in their history. And you would be very surprised. I get around the country a whole lot. Uh, and you would be, I think, surprised and delighted to know how appreciative uh, the people of this country are in general, and young people in particular, for the incredible legacy that the Native American people have given us. Uh, your culture, your respect for the environment, your willingness to think generations in front rather than focusing on short-term profits has had a profound impact upon millions and millions of people in this country, and I thank you very much for that. And that is the good news and a good news that everybody in this room should be proud of. The bad news is I think we understand uh, not only the history of what has happened in America over the last 500 or so years, the lies that have been told to the Native Americans, the treaties that have been signed but then abrogated, the taking away of sovereignty that had been promised, the refusal to listen to the pain of the Native American people from way back till today is something that my wife Jane, where's Jane, is she here? Stand up Jane if you could please. Jane and I, I feel very strongly and I want to say that during the last campaign I ran in 2016 we had the opportunity quite intentionally to visit reservations Native American communities because we thought it was terribly important that the plight and the suffering of the Native American people
be made known to the whole country. And I'm proud of the role that I played in trying to raise consciousness about what is happening. I'll never forget going to Pine Ridge and learning that the life expectancy in that reservation is in fact where many poor third world countries are. And it is no secret to you that the healthcare system that now exists for the Native American people is nowhere near where it should be. And we are going to improve that. We are going to fight for a Medicare for all single payer system and in the middle of that we are going to make sure that the Native American people have comprehensive health care as a human right, not as a privilege. And our job is also, and I know how important it is, to protect the sacred lands of the Native American people. I was proud to have been there, not physically, but in every other way, standing with the Native American people at Standing Rock. And I do that, I do that, A, because it is imperative that we respect the sovereignty and the land that is sacred to the Native American people. But in addition to that, for your children and your grandchildren and mine as well, we must do everything we can to address the existential crisis facing this planet in terms of climate change. And that is why together, together, we are going to take on the fossil fuel industry and tell them that their short-term profits are not more important than the future of our planet. And if there's anything in the culture of the Native American people, it is precisely that. To understand that greed and uh, short-term profits are not more important than the way people live and the sanctity of our land. I am aware also, and I guess we'll discuss this in a moment, about the epidemic which now exists, exists in terms of violence against women. And this is an issue that will be very, very high up on my agenda. Uh, we will see cooperation between the federal government and the sovereign Indian nations uh, in order to address this crisis. Last point that I want to make, and there are so many issues that are out there, is that I know that many people in the Native American community feel that the federal government for years has turned their backs on your issues and your concerns. At best, you've been able to get a seat at the table, but as often as that has taken place, your words and your concerns have not been heard. You can talk, but nobody listens. And we intend to change that. We intend, if there's anybody, if it is not you who should be involved in determining Native American policy in the United States, then I don't know who should be involved. Certainly not a bunch of bureaucrats in Washington. All right. So I want to thank you all personally, and, and Jane has been deeply involved in these issues for years. And I want to thank you for reminding the American people about some very, very deep values that we must adhere to. And that is respect for the environment, respect for the land, respect for our traditions, respect for promises made to a people that have been broken. And I know it has been a long and painful history I know that in your communities, the arrival of Columbus is not something that is widely celebrated. But I think it is time to turn the road. I think it is time to fundamentally change U.S. government policy to the Native American people 
And as President of the United States, I would be so pleased to help lead that effort with you. Thank you so much. No, no, you stay down. You stay down. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Welcome. Thank you very much. We begin our uh, questions with the words of an elder, Marcella LeBeau. My name is Marcella LeBeau from the Shine River Reservation, from the Two Kettle Band, and I'm honored to be in your presence. Ms. Mr. Sanders, I want to say that I had the honor and privilege of being a nurse in World War II. I served in Wales, England, France, and Belgium, and that was my great honor. But I do have a question, and this relates to the massacre at Wounded Knee. And to me, my personal opinion, there is a pervasive sadness that exists on our reservation because of unresolved grief when these 20 medals of honor were given to the 7th Cavalry soldiers when they, at the massacre at Wounded Knee, when they killed approximately 250 women and children and, and the leader who was ill with pneumonia. And so all of these things have a bearing on what the feelings and helplessness of people on our reservation the elders, the children, everyone. And so my question is, will you support the removal of the STAIN Act? That is my question. The answer is absolutely. <laughs> Medals of Honor are given rarely, and they're given to people who do very, very important things. And I want to thank you for your work. I know you received recognition, I believe, from the French government and elsewhere for the work you have done in World War II and saving lives. That's the type of a person who receives medals of honor. They're very rare, and they're given to people who show great, great bravery. Massacring women and children is not an act of great bravery. It is an act of depravity, depravity. You know, this afternoon and in the few minutes that I have here, we're not going to resolve all of the issues of the last 500 years. But I think it is important, not differently, by the way, than how we deal with the abomination of slavery that the time is long overdue for us to be having that discussion of what happened when the first settlers came here and the terrible and horrible things that were done to the Native American people, not only at Wounded Knee, but in so many other places. I think that is a discussion that the American people actually want to have. And at the end of that discussion must be the necessity of us doing everything that we can to repair the damage, the psychological damage, the humiliations, and also address the real needs of the Native American people today, who in many cases are living in poverty. So there's a lot of work to be done. But to acknowledge, and it will not be easy, a lot of pain there, but to acknowledge what the settlers have did when they came here and what has happened over the last many, many years is something that this country is going to have to address. And as president, I look forward to addressing it with you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Our next question comes from Faith Spotted Eagle. Thank you, 
on Kichiapi. They had a Hanakji 1858 treaty. Oh, wow, he 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 I am a Kuchasha of the Braveheart Society. My Kushi asked me to translate for her because she is worried about her grandchildren's grandchildren's future and wants to pursue or preserve our language. My Kushi is Faith Spotted Eagle Standing Stone of the Yankton. We offer you a friendly handshake from our homelands. She is 70 years old and fought for her water since her home of the White Swan was destroyed by the Fort Randall Dam on the Missouri River. She is chair of the Yankton Treaty Community member of the Braveheart Society. And she is the, she's the only Native American woman to receive an electoral vote from the pres president of the US in 2016. This is my Kushi. The other reason I wanted uh, Takoja to do this is it's really lack of protocol for us to introduce ourselves in, in native camps and to brag about ourselves. So I couldn't say all those things about myself. So <laughs> somebody might think I'm lying. So my, my granddaughter has rescued me. The other thing is that I wanted to show the face of the grandchildren, that this is truly what we are here for today. And us with adultism, sometimes we don't make room, so here they are. There's one over there. <clears throat> this is the Dakota language. We have three dialects, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, but we understand each other when we want to. And we um, are from, the. a lot of the Washichu people couldn't pronounce our names, so they call us Sioux, but we are Dakota, Lakota, Nakota. So, tribes shouldn't have to expend our scarce resources to protect our drinking water, our land, our people, the fish, and the animals in that water. The federal government is required to protect us through this trust responsibility that was signed by my grandfather and many other grandfathers that gave over 200,000 acres, half of South Dakota. So we had prepaid health care. We had many prepaid issues that are not uh, being lived up to. Our subsistence practices, our gathering rights, ceremonial, cultural use, our water security, uh, reproductive justice should be protect, protected, not further polluted through fracking, KXL pipeline, line three, other pipelines, and corporate intrusions, specifically foreign direct investment and development that disregards and deletes us. This has proven to increase the incidence of thousands of murdered and missing women, the MMIW, which you most um, articulately addressed. Our women are traditionally held up as keepers of the water. The first water is the medicine in the womb. Now, besides protecting our water, we are forced to prepare for the onslaught and destructive force for, from thousands of men in a word that is very misogynistic in nature. It's called man camps. So that word itself is very misogynistic, it's violent, and it actually, the MMIW issue is not new. The thousands of men who came to our territory in the form of the forts, I live at Fort Randall, and that was an example of the MMIW that came at the very first contact, even leading back to Columbus, who captured some of our women. So it's important to put that in perspective, but this, of course, is not just about us. This pipeline, these fracking efforts, these environmental destructions are not for our benefit, the public interest, but they actually are predator economics. They're created in a corporate purpose, which has nothing to do with the people of this land. The other thing I want to say is that um, as a PTSD therapist and as a person who helps people heal, the word PTSD is a misnomer. I'm thinking about renaming it CTSB, which is Concurring Continual Traumatic Stress Disorder, because the trauma never ended. When we say PTSD, we act like it happened in the 1800s. It is happening every single day. 
The other issue that comes to mind with MMIW is that it's almost government policy that we are not grievable. So thousands of women are killed, but the corporate people say, oh, Section 106 consultation will take care of that, saying that you, you can't grieve even though your, your baby girls have died. So that's the government policy is that we are not grievable. That's a violation of a human right. The other thing is um, with endangered species, we have a whole different language and the language is capitalism versus indig indigenous values. Because for us, there is no such <coughs> thing as separation from animal. We have alliances of sustainable development with our <coughs> relatives and you notice that the animals are starting to attack the humans. We've had buffalo attack, we've had bear attacks, but they know that we are not living up to the alliance that we had originally, that we would protect them. They even offer their lives up so we can live. And so the animal nation knows that, and so we have to pay attention. The other thing, when we talk about um, the public benefit, it's really important to realize that we live <coughs> in one of the most violent countries of the world. We live in systems of violence that are benevolent in nature. Indian Health Service is benevolent in nature. I'm sitting here with a knee that needs to be replaced and it's going on 15 years. And because my limb is not destroyed enough, I'm not dying, that Indian Health Service will not honor my treaty right. So I appreciate all of you that help me as I continue to fight for this old knee. Um, but those are the issues, unless you are almost dead, you don't get any help from a treaty right that my grandfather and many of your people. Um, so what we're talking about is institutional racism. So now I'll get to my question, but um, I know that um, our friend, if I can call you Bernie, Please. has already addressed this, but I think it's a deeper issue. We had a wonderful person from the Diné Nation talked this morning and he talked about consultation is just a, an artificial thing. What has to be changed is the basis of a country that considers itself a conqueror and has created laws that benefit only them. Consultation needs to be consent. And it's, it's so my question for you, how will you promote and protect the exercise of a tribal inherent aboriginal and treaty rights on water and public land and further to do an investigation a congressional review of how fort randall dam was built illegally on ihantua lands that's my question thank you i begin the language you were speaking was Lakota, yes? Okay. Dakota. Dakota. And it reminds me, and this is a language now that you are struggling to preserve and make sure that the young people can learn it, can know it. Okay. And it, it speaks to me when I hear the language, of which, of course, I did not understand one word. Um, but it speaks to me the importance of us knowing where we came from if we're going to know where we're going forward and the need to preserve as much as we can the culture and the history of the united states which among other things means language to make sure that our kids native american kids and kids all over this country <clears throat> understand the history of their country their real history where they came from, and the languages that those who came before them uh, spoke. And count me as an ally to provide the financial resources, which is not easy. Not many people probably are still speaking that language. Is that correct? All right. And it's terribly important that it be preserved. Um, you raised a number of questions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it is unacceptable to me that treaties signed and agreements made were then rescinded or simply not acknowledged. And that is the history of the Native American people, yeah? 
So you have a treaty, as I think you indicated, which says you are guaranteed health care as a right. And that treaty has certainly been abrogated. And I think we all understand that the Indian Health Service is not doing anywhere near what it should be doing. As somebody who believes absolutely that health care is a human right for the Native American people and for everybody else, we will reform fundamentally the Indian Health Service so that it will take care of your knee and the needs of all Native American people. And the truth of the matter is, you know, I know people say, well, you know, the truth is this, within the context of a multi-trillion dollar federal government, is not an expensive proposition. We could provide quality health care to every Native American person, and trust me, it'll cost a, a lot less than one new weapon system for the Pentagon. All right, so, so this is not... This is not, you know, some kind of outrageous promise that I'm making to you. It really is not all that expensive, and it's something that is doing. You raised other issues. You raised the issue about corporate, eight corporations, fossil fuel corporations coming in, uh, trying to uh, ex either uh, excavate for minerals or develop uh, fuel lines uh, and pipelines that will transport fossil fuel. And I respond to you in two ways, that you are right. Consultation is not the issue. The issue is signing off on something, saying I agree with it or not. So we are not going to be an administration that says, well, here it is, I'm consulting you as to what we are doing. We will sit down as equals, hear your point of view, and we will work out an agreement that works for you. Second point, in terms of fossil fuels, and the pipelines, as I said a moment ago, climate change is threatening not only your way of life, not only the United States of America, it is threatening the entire planet. All right, and it pains me, it pains me very much that we have a president who believes that climate change is a hoax. It is not a hoax. It is a threat to this country and every country on earth. And as President of the United States, my job will be to stand up to the fossil fuel industry in this country and tell them that their short-term profits are not more important than the future of our planet and to reach out to countries all over the world because this is not just a problem that we can solve alone. Right now, around this world, Nations are spending somewhere around a trillion and a half dollars on weapons of destruction designed to kill each other. And maybe, just maybe, if we had adequate leadership in the White House, the most powerful government on earth, maybe we can convince governments all over the world that instead of spending a trillion and a half dollars a year killing each other, maybe we should use those resources combine those resources against our common enemy, which is climate change, and save the planet for our children and our grandchildren. And the last point that I want to make, and I made this, I met with some of you in Detroit a few weeks ago, and I think the question was, will you hear from us? Will you, will you allow us to participate? And the answer is, we will do more than that, because you have so much to explain and teach the people of our country about respect for nature, working, and you indicated with the animals, working, understanding that we are part of nature. We can't go to war against nature and then expect to have clean water or decent food. And if there's any people in this country today who know what that is about, it is you. And we need you to help explain that, not only to our country, but to the world. You have a history which is rich and important, and at this moment of environmental crises, this is the time for the Native American people, working with an administration that respects the Native American people, to help us transform our entire economy to one which is not at war with nature, but is part of nature.
Our next question comes from Douglas Cox, the nominee. Oso Moani Wheel, Tanawe Makana, Shikaswisi, and Wasa Kane. Welcome, Senator. Thank you for being here and participating in this forum. I need to really quickly also thank um, those that lands that were on, so the Omaha, the Winnebago, the Dakota, um, who are gracious enough to allow us to be here on their land today. So I say, well, when, and thank you for that. <laughs> I'd also like to say thank you really quick to Four Directions. OJ and his folks have done an exceptional job putting this together. So well, when for that. <laughs> I also brought a youth with me, Senator. So um, seated to my right is uh, Forrest, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Cedar Fernandez. So I brought her with me. She's traveled, We've been here both days. This truly is our future. This is what we're embedded for, and that's why she's here. So, so I've got a little bit of repetitiveness. So I know you. I know in your intro you talked about climate change, and you just answered that again. So I apologize for that, but I'm going to really quickly give you one specific question at the end. So tribes have historically lived from the land, and today is no different. We have located ourselves in these places that are environmentally significant, waterways, forests, prairies, and mountains. But today, these places are threatened by development's carbon footprint, resulting in floods, temperature changes, loss in diversity, impacts to plants, animals, and tree species, which in turn are threatening our ways of life. These changes are already resulting in coastal impacts. Melting ice, rising water levels have literally forced our native peoples to relocate historic villages that have been there for generations. Historic fish migrations are being interrupted. Animal patterns are impacted. Wildfires are dynamically changing, burning hotter and longer. Today, a tribe do not have the option of migrating to areas of historic occupation. We're limited to our reservation boundaries, which were created when our ancestors signed those treaties with the U.S. government. Case in point is our Menominee tribe. Located in the Midwest in central Wisconsin, we have long been recognized for worldwide sustainable forestry practices, maintaining our diverse quarter million acres of forest over the past hundreds of years. Now in the face of a warming climate, invasive species, regional vegetation composition changes, our forests and our historic way of life are facing serious threats. So when you combine this, as you stated, with the current administration that's rolling back protections like the Clean Power Plan, lifting moratoriums on coal burning power, and opening our sacred lands to minerals and energy extractions, like in Menominee's case, trying to protect our sacred Menominee River from a large mine development called the Back 40 Mine, an open pit travesty, we ask that ask you that how will your administration take climate change and specific climate challenges faced by tribal communities? Well, in a few ways. Um, number one, we will respect tribal sovereignty and we will not turn our backs as large corporations. Sometimes corporations from other countries come in and rape the land that belongs to the Native American people. That's number one. Number two, we will work with you. I mean, this is, as I mentioned, again, let me stress this again, because I am sincere in saying this. I'm not here just to say, we're gonna do this for you. I need you to play a leadership role in terms of sustainability. You have your people more than any people in our country can teach us about sustainability, all right? The Native American people do not kill thousands and thousands of buffalo because they understood that the buffalo gave them life. Am I right on that? Right. Sustainability. You don't wipe out you know, the trees. You don't deforest. In Brazil right now as we speak there's massive deforestation going on which will impact the entire planet. People want to make money. They want more land for whatever they want it for. They want the trees. But what the Native American people can teach us, and I'm not an expert, honey, you know more about it than I do. We need that wisdom now more than ever. This planet is right now on the verge 
You talked about rising sea levels, Arctic ice melting, coastal areas flooding. July last month was the warmest month ever recorded. Europe having heat waves. We need to radically rethink our relationship to nature. Okay? So we will protect, of course, uh, the Native American uh, areas, land that you own, that is yours from foreign invasion. And more than that, we have got to work together. It's not easy stuff. We got a very limited amount of time before irreparable damage is done to this planet. Okay? How do we move aggressively forward in terms of energy efficiency? How do we move forward in terms of sustainable agriculture? How do we move forward in terms of more and more solar and wind energy and other forms of sustainable technology? Not easy stuff. But that is what we are going to have to do if we're going to preserve this planet for our children and our grandchildren. And in my administration, it's not a question of listening to the Native American people. It is having you up there up front, giving us your history and your culture about how we can work with nature and not against nature. Thank you, Senator. I'm really uh, hoping we can get the last few questions in, so we're going into the speed round. Uh, Janet Davis, uh, voting or from uh, Pyramid Lake. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm honored to be here today with you, and I'm glad that you came to see us and talk to our tribal leaders and our communities. Um, my question is about equal access to voting. In 2016, U.S. Judge Du granted a temporary injunction in Reno, Nevada, requiring the establishment of satellite polling sites to two Nevada reservations, my tribe, the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe, and the Walker River Paiute Tribe. Members of our tribes were being denied equal access to the polls due to long distances. Um, polling booths were set up for both on election day as were the early voting sites. The county told us it was too late to recruit and train poll workers, and we told them we could, and we did. Our two Nevada tribes have set the standard in 2016 to equal access to voting for tribal citizens on reservations in the United States. We hope to lead the way for other tribes as our vote is our voice. My question to you is, how will you ensure that all Native Americans on reservations have the same access without having to litigate as we did? May I be blunt and straightforward? We have a corrupt political system designed to protect the wealthy and the powerful. What happened to your people is just one example of the kind of voter suppression that is taking place all over this country. You would think that in a de democratic society, every elected official would say, our voter turnout is not as high as we would like it to be. Many other countries have higher voting turnout rates. What do we do to get more people involved in the political process? How do we end up having the highest voter turnout rate of any country on earth because we believe in democracy, one person, one vote, all right? But what you got right now are two things. And again, I'm gonna be, I guess, I don't apologize for being partisan. I am running for president of the United States, so I'll be a little bit partisan. All right, you got a Republican party out there that really understands that they cannot win elections based on their policies. Not only their policies against the Native American people, but their policies in general. Most Americans don't believe we should give tax breaks to billionaires. Most Americans don't believe we should ignore climate change. Most Americans don't believe we should cut Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and education. That's not what the American people believe. That is literally the program of the Republican Party. Now, if you have a program that most people reject, how do you win elections? Well, you win elections in two ways. Number one, you create a process by which billionaires and very, very wealthy people can buy elections by being able to contribute 
hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. So issue number one is the need to overturn a disastrous Supreme Court decision called Citizens United. All right. All right. Billionaires do not have the right to buy elections. Democracy is one person, one vote. You get a vote, and you get a vote, and you get a vote, majority wins. Now the second thing they do is after they have their billionaire friends buying elections, then they still got to worry because you got a lot of working people and low-income people who are prepared to vote to fight for health care for all, to make sure that all of our kids, regardless of income, can get a higher education, which is why we're fighting to make public colleges and universities tuition free. A lot of people, including me, believe that we should cancel all student debt in America. That we should raise the minimum wage to a living wage of at least 15 bucks an hour. Now, and that we need criminal justice reform and immigration reform, all these issues out there. So, if you've got people who believe in that, how do I win an election if I believe everything opposite of that? I make it harder for people to vote. And the people I am targeting now are people of color, Native American people, Latino people, African American people. I target young people. I target young people. In New Hampshire, right now, a very deliberate effort to make it harder for young people to participate in the political process. So that is what's going on. What is the answer? The answer is to have a president and an attorney general who's going to do everything that we can to make sure that every eligible voter in this country is able to vote. We're going to take on voter suppression in all of its forms. And that means you don't, you don't take, make it impossible to get to a, a polling place, which was your case. It means also that we move toward a system which says very simply that in the United States of America, if you are 18 years of age or older, you have the right to vote and of discussion. So this is an issue we feel strongly about. This is when it's no fun to be a moderator. I'm afraid uh, our time has expired. And I know this is a conversation that could go on for another hour. Please give a thank you to Senator Sanders and the panel. Thank you.